Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Friday. It's Video Friday. Video Friday. With Stephen Haskin, he's the guest on TLD. That video Friday. We're glad to have you here today. Hey. Keep chatting in the chat. We'll get all your questions. Keep chatting in the chat. Maybe have someone in the video. We're talking video today. Video Friday. <laughs> Stephen Haskin, welcome yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I asked what his, his music was, and he said everything. But we're just here in New Orleans, or yes, <laughs> most recently, <laughs> most recently met in New Orleans at the online learning conference, and that New Orleans groove is still very much in my head. It's hard to escape from here. So. It, it, it is, is hard to escape. It is. Like I have to change my speakers. Not that anyone would ever want to escape. It's so nice to just be around great music all the time. It's. It was. Um... The hotel was had great canned music in it. It was always <laughs> canned. yes. It's not your music. <laughs> no. So um, welcome everyone to Video Friday. We'll be talking today about um, not just the online video conference, but the training video awards were part of that conference. Uh, aside from any recent news and events, Steve Haskin, who we had as a guest when we were uh, in the previous iteration of the show, an L and D talk. Um, is uh, an expert making the rounds in, in all the conferences and doing some great work with industrial strength learning, um, specifically with video. So any questions that you have about video, Steve is a great guy to ask. Because he answers. He, he does, and he answers, <laughs> he answers often in, in very long ways. We'll try and steer this towards a... Uh, I'll try and be... A, yeah, concise. something that's 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 okay. <laughs> you can just see who you are. Today. We're going to try to answer as many questions as we can, <laughs> as fast as we possibly can, uh, in, the, in the true form of uh, maybe New Orleans style jazz. <laughs> right. 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 Well, first, before we jump into all that conversation, let me just do the usual rundown and just tell everybody about TLD Chat. We are the Training, Learning, and Development Chat. We are also a conference and community. You can join us and become a member of the community. Uh, well, anybody can become a member of the community just by hanging out in TLD chat because TLD chat is always something free that anybody can hang out in and join us and learn from their peers and their network. But if you'd like to go that extra mile, you can become a member and get all the value of membership. And then, of course, in January, January 29th and 30th, we have the wonderful and amazing TLDC 18 event. It's going to be held in Phoenix, Arizona, and it is going to be awesome. Two days of fantastic speakers and lots and lots of engagement and working on the work of training, learning, and development in all of its many forms. But today is Video Friday, and so that's why we're here, and that's what we're going to talk about today, because we have our wonderful guest and my co-host, Sam Rogers. Yes, and I see that uh, Mark is here, and Kara's here, and Craig is here, and I never, I, I didn't catch the pronunciation. You know it better than anyone, Brent. How do you say uh, what's... Oh, I think I can do this. I have to roll the R, though. Let's see if I can get Yarun. Okay, there we go. Yes, so How we have you? we have our European representation as well. I think we can. Uh, so, um, so Steve, I would love to hear a little bit about your impressions of um, of the training video awards. Um, you've been to quite a few of them. This was the first time that I'd attended one of these events. Um, how many have you been to? First off, I think this is the fourth one. Something, Great. Something like that. And one thing that I noticed this year 
and I'll compare this year to last year. Last year, the professionally, quote unquote, professionally made ones, which were the outsourced videos, weren't as good as the homemade ones, which huh. is kind of close to my heart. I like that. Wow. And this year, the professional ones, there was one of the three that just stood out. Um, the, the, the homemade videos honestly weren't as good as they just were not as good. As, and I was, I was kind of disappointed. They had as many as entries this year. And the way they work it is that the audience votes and the, they show three professional and three homemade ones. And then the audience votes after each, after each group of three, so that you get the professional winner and then you get the, the homemade winner. And by the way, I don't believe that homemade is not an implication that the video is not professional. Um, it's just a, it, you know, it's just the way they have to divide it up. You know, is it made by the training department mm -hmm. or is it made by, um, is it made by the, uh, is, is it made by some other department in the organization? If there's a video department and it's still considered homemade. Right. It's kind and, of the, the weight class that you're competing in. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> what they think. You know, that's the way they do it. And the one that won in the professional division, or if you want to call that, or the, or the outsourced division, that's better, um, was funny because of the script. The script was well written. So guess who wrote the script? <laughs> the training department. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so could they have pulled off? They probably didn't feel like they had the expertise. And then the the ones that were done by training departments didn't seem as good as mm -hmm. they did last year. So I was kind of, I don't know if disappointed the right is the right word, but I was kind of, mm, I wish it could have been better. Yeah. That's, I guess I'll leave it at that. Do they talk much about the, the the actual problem that the video is trying to solve, though? And and perhaps because um, this is something that I've always thought about these awards, it's that they seem so fleeting. And a lot of times, you watch the video and you look at it for its quality and its production value and its development, and we think, ah, uh, yeah, it's not as good as it was before. But maybe there was a reason why they had to go low budget, low quality, and maybe it solved a really important need. And so the the ROI, if you will, or the, the the value or the money spent, you know, in relation to the the size of the problem it solved was more important than the really, really well produced, you know, awesomely developed video. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I don't know, I don't even know how you would do that kind of a um an awards thing. It would take a lot more effort, I would think, than just showing everybody the videos and saying, which one do you like? Uh, and I it think therein take, lies the problem. It, it, there's yeah. about 200 entries on each side of the of that equation. And they, they get called by a committee. And part of the equation is, is it solving a problem? And that's a, I, I'd say that's a pretty important part of that equation. But it's, um, it's yes, they, they they do look at does it solve a problem, and that that's a very good question, because just doing a video that doesn't solve an, an issue or you know advance an issue or teach somebody or do what it's supposed to do, doesn't matter how the production values are right. or how good or how bad they are. Um, they they did approach different problems, and it was pretty obvious from watching them, but the quality of solution. That's an interesting way to put it. But the quality of solution wasn't as good this year as bad last year. And I'm not just talking about, you know, is it a good commercial? Is it a bad commercial? Is it funny? Is it not funny? Um, it's just the videos didn't approach problems this year the same as they did last year. So it was it was just different. It was it's been an I think it's been an unusual year in a lot of ways. Um not going there. But it's, <laughs> but it's, um, Stay positive, Steve. Stay positive. But it, it's been uh, unusual. Um, but it's it it was the videos were were just maybe it was 
more difficult to make them this year? I don't know. But they weren't as good as they were last year. Last year, the winner with, in the with two hundred coming in though, wow, that's a think? that's pretty that's a pretty strong statement. If you've got two hundred coming in and 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 that's a lot of videos, and you know, there really isn't one that really stood out for you, huh? Nothing really hit me between the eyes. Last year in Chicago, um, the the winner in the homemade division was made by the LDS church. And it was, not only was it hilarious, yeah, that was a good it one. actually got a message across. And the, the professional one was also very funny and it got, a, it got the message across. And you could tell from just watching two minutes of it that it was, you know, it was just a really good thing, I guess it was, you know, yeah, Steve, Different. you you and I saw each other at the uh, the online learning conference, and I can't remember what year it was. Do you it remember? Was two years ago in Denver. So it was, so it was, yeah, we were in Denver. So that was 2015. Was that it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there was a good one there too. I remember yes. the one that won that one was really really good. And actually, there were a couple of them that were really yeah. good for different reasons. That was a it was a good year. Yes. Yeah. It was. And, and last year was a good year, and. It was, it was always, it, it was, it, it, everybody was commenting that the quality, that had seen him the last few years, had co were commenting that the quality just wasn't the same. And nobody knows why. It's, it's, maybe it's a quirk, I hope. Well, so, um, I think that there's. Lightning safety, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I yeah, that. the lightning safety one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's it's great that there is so many submissions and, um, you know, having that process that the uh, that Training Magazine does to kind of cull them down and then let the audience vote on the last ones. It does tend to favor funny when you do that. Um, but um, the fact that there are so many submissions maybe means that the, the bar has kind of been lowered as far as people who are turning things in. And other people, like like guests that we've had on before, such as um, Cine Learning Productions or, or things like that that have already won in past years, aren't necessarily contributing the whole way. So, yeah, it's it's just uh, luck of the draw, although there were good videos, not, not to be too disparaging about the ones that won. And... and um, uh, we will have one of the winners as a guest on a future Video Friday episode. Cool. Uh, the um, uh, BNSF Railways one. I don't know if you remember that. Um, I certainly do. So um, uh, we're we're hoping to have Erica Plum on to talk about that in a in a future episode and what her experience was of all of that. Um, the the evening itself was way fun. Uh, it started with a uh, a second line, which for those that are unfamiliar, it's it's uh, it's kind of a New Orleans thing. It's actually comes from like a the jazz funeral tradition, where you have the the big brass band in the front, and then um, in this case, people just kind of walked. But you're really supposed to like dance and join the band, uh, walking behind the band from the hotel to the venue where this event was happening, and. They are a hot brass band. The hot eight brass band is amazing. And I've seen them five or six times previous to this. So um, nice. Big fan. It was, hey, let's, it was a nice uh, night. let's let's jump into something here real quick and um, and dial all of this back one step. I, we've got a question in the queue from Craig. And I know, Sam, you dropped a couple questions in there, too, which I think are good. But let's just start with the extreme basics um, as what are we defining as video? This is not a joke question. He wants to yeah. know, seriously, um, how are we <laughs> defining the video? So is it real people that are moving across the screen, actors and all of that? Is it animation? Is it words with animation? Is it output from a WM or output as a WMV file? Or is it all of the above? I think that it's all of the above. I don't see video as just being live people. Um, I don't see video as be being words moving across the screen. And I, I don't see videos just being animation. I see this being all of that. I mean, if you're- Of, of all those 200 submissions, um, were there any that were 
I mean, did, did, did you see a lot of that stuff? I mean, I don't know, maybe you weren't on the committee or whatever. I don't know. But, um, uh, like it, did they, were the, were the videos that were submitted all coming in all various shapes and styles and, yes. and whatnot? Yeah. Okay. I would say so. The, so. So some were like graphical animations, others were actors with scripts and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Okay. The graphical animations yeah. tended to yeah. have kind of mixed mixed media between animation and graphics and and things like that, and some people. Um, it's it, it, it's it, video's a tough thing to you know to just put a a box around it. You know, it's right. like sure. You know, and then the because um, we export screen capture simulations as video files, right? We, and we, you know, we we do a lot of things in the video format, and so understanding, you know, just I, <laughs> here's a video coming in right now, yeah, really. <laughs> and we have live video, and we have all these different terms for video. So I think that was a great question, Craig. Thanks for asking. I think it's important that we uh, that we kind of get a baseline when we talk about video on Video Fridays. Yeah, and I think, you know, animated GIFs and things like that can, I'm not sure if they technically count. It, it kind of depends on how you're defining it. There weren't any entries that I saw in this training video awards that were animated GIFs. But I, I think anytime you've got moving images, um, we're, we're in the realm of it starts to become video. I mean, it, it, if it's a good, back to what Steve was saying, if it's a good solution, if it's something that matches with what the need is and it, and it provides that in a simple and effective way, it kind of exactly. doesn't matter what you call it. Um, but, uh, but I, I would say anything that's, that's moving images um, works for video. And speaking of video, I'm feeling a little constrained oh, yeah, here sorry. in this arrangement, <laughs> Brent. Can we have a little more? Ah, uh, much looser now. Yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for Take the heads up, everybody. I yeah. appreciate that. All right, so let's do that. So that was an excellent question. So let's jump right into Video Friday, the tech geeky stuff. Let's geek out on this for a while. So, um, uh, is, uh, Steve, do you have any favorite production toys? My favorite production toys, interesting. Might wind up being the Samsung 360 camera. Um, yesterday, great. We talk about that. We started a conference yesterday morning. I, I was calling it the anti-conference, but we've changed it to conference reimagined because the first thing probably, we do- Probably better for marketing. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. You don't want to be anti-anything. Um, you, you, this conference was totally outside the hotel. And instead of drinking conference coffee in the morning, they had a, um, a truck- a coffee truck and everybody could go out and order their lattes or cappuccinos or espressos or whatever you wanted and very, very good quality. And we were off the site and we were actually at the Tulane School of Architecture. I think it was urban planning, uh, like a little space they've got for, for urban planning. And Samsung came in with, um, um, Samsung came in with with a with a whole mess of of um, Galaxy Eights. I couldn't remember the name of the phone, um, and and face bricks to put to put on, and a whole bunch of different mm -hmm. VR kinds of kinds of things. And then we demoed how easy it is to make virtual reality, which was kind of cool. And the night before, this conference kicked off with a wine tasting and a dinner in a space called Launchpad. And Launchpad is like an entrepreneurial kind of a space. And the whole concept is not to have people talking necessarily with slides and stuff, but the, you know, there's some slides. And it, but it's, it's more about putting people in, in environments where they have opportunities to learn about topics they may not have ever encountered before and which I can, I'll mm -hmm. go into in, in just a second. And the wine tasting was actually a wine tasting and dinner. And it's the second, no, it's the third time we've done it. And sadly, I can't make it to Ireland in two weeks to do it again. <laughs> so we'll have to wait until 
um, next year to, to do it again. Um, it's a great way to kick off a, a meeting. I get to use my wine, you know, being an old MS, right? It's like, then we go and uh, go and select the wines and, and we just go to a good wine store and, you know, there were 60 people. Do you, so do thing. you have the 360? Do you have the Samsung 360? I do not have it with me right now, but yes. And you can get them for, I think they were on sale for under a hundred dollars. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I've seen them. I've seen them as low as like yeah, 150 are, or something like that. Yeah. I hadn't seen them going they are that. going after them after that market. And, um, so has anybody, has anybody seen hmm. any really good training done with shooting on the 360 that they couldn't, that you couldn't have done with just regular video as an immersive environment? That's a interesting question. I saw one that was, it was combination of, I guess, of augmented reality and virtual reality because you had the brick on, on your face. And somebody, Microsoft engineer called that a face brick last year at a conference and I went, yeah, that's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much it. And I don't, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be like yep. a, a, you know, Debbie Downer on the whole thing, but I think it's valuable for us as we, uh, as we look at the new tech to talk the realities of it. Right. And so it's, yeah. it's great to see Josh yes. saying that, yes, he has seen some good um, uh, training shot with it, but um, you know, I'm just, I just want us to be, you know, dig in a little bit deeper than just, yeah, we like it. And yeah, it's cool. You know, what kind of problem does it solve that a regular video where you don't have to wear the face brick? Right. Right. A, two, a 2D video. Would solve. Right. Well, what was interesting is the one that I thought that really solved an issue was a, I think it was like GE or, or I, I don't know who makes jet engines or, or whatever, but um, they were showing the, they were doing a fly through of a jet engine, a live fly through and showing how to repair certain parts and how to determine if they needed repair. And you could actually reach your hand. Mm. That was the augmented part was that they had it. So you could reach your hand into the engine um, without obviously hurting yourself, which is. So when you're important. doing that, kind of, that takes more than the 360 video camera. Right. Though, right? That's why it was augmented in, in addition to the, to that. Okay. And, so we're going to have to talk about that in a little bit, but I'll let you finish that. But yeah, okay. we're, I don't want to extend our, our tech geekiness too far without explaining how that kind of works. Okay. <laughs> well, the, it's interesting because you've got this thing, this whole kind of space called virtual reality. And I think by itself that VR is just a toy, just, you can do it. It's easier to do. Um, but if you add augmented, if you augment that reality, or you can do augmented reality in, in 2d video, but it's, it can be a very, very powerful tool that I've seen used several times where you can take objects and manipulate them. And, you know, they might be 3D objects or whatever, but you can manipulate them. You can learn how to repair them, uh, which, which that obviously that's a, that's a really good learning kind of thing. It's, um, it's not for, let's say, HR training or compliance in, in a hospital. But it definitely has a place in machine manufacturing, um, all kinds of industries where there are objects. Because I think the object is the most important part. It um, seems, yeah, I, uh, the thing that really struck for me, it didn't really uh, make sense to me when Josh mentioned the pilot training for the 360 being good for that kind of thing. It, it, um, I started questioning it in my own mind, but then he mentioned, you know, being able to rotate around and, and, you know, look at the whole 360 of the whole compartment. And then all of a sudden that starts to make sense. So if you've got a manufacturing facility, or if you are working in a, in a manufacturing space where your work involves interacting with something that's both in front of you and behind you, uh, you know, then I think that's where a 360 interactive solution can be a lot better than just um, a, a still 2D video, because then you're only able to train them with the 2D, which is regular classic video, I guess we'll call it that. 
um, you, you know, you could show people what to do on the one side, but then you'd have to do some sort of edit or a pan to show them that you spun around and, oh yeah, there's this other piece of equipment behind you that now we're going to teach you about. Whereas if you had the 360 video, then they're, then they're around themselves and now you've got that deeper engagement that right. um, I, I really do believe would probably add a significant amount of value. And, and I Josh knew once, just mentioned some I, stats I knew once that, we started um, talking VR and AR, it would summon Marco. So good to see you, Marco, my yellow friend. <laughs> <laughs> the um, Josh just said something about the there's some crazy stats on on YouTube about it, and that most people only watch 180 degrees which actually makes sense yeah because if you think about it it's and i think that's a lot of that's because most people still uh engage with youtube via a browser or via their mobile phone and they just want to look at the prime thing that's trying to be shown right and it's yeah. not there really isn't a lot of I, I think it's still gimmicky. It's still at that phase where people yeah. really aren't sure yet what it is that we need to do to get people, even if you want to, to spin around and to see what's behind them or, or what the value even is in it. And do you want people to get sick? You know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think one of the ones that I saw was um, it was a marketing piece, but they, they would, they put you into a, uh, um, a garage, I remember, and you was, you started hearing this voice talking off to the right, and so you immediately turn your head, and there's this TV playing with what you're supposed to be watching on it, but they yeah. purposefully set you up looking at this car up on the thing and, and acquaint you that you're in a garage first before, but then they have the noise to kind of cue you to spin around to listen to and see what's going on. So I I, I think the more we get spatial audio, yeah. the yeah. the more that that's going to help with with the full uh, 360 because we don't um, we're maybe not as consciously aware of it, but when we hear something, we know to yeah. look there, and we don't really have that well. I, and the the video has gone ahead of the audio, but in terms of like perception of of how we know where to direct our attention, it has a lot more to do and with what we're, we're hearing. Yeah, exactly. And I think that seeing. we're in the beginning of this whole uh, this whole virtual reality 360 video kind of thing that we're talking about here. Um, the, the the bit the good part is that w is that the equipment is cheap now. The bad part is you still have to wear Facebook. Yeah. You still have to put that thing in front of your face. Um, it needs to be more of a hall of graphic projection or something something i don't know what i don't know what the technological solution will be but when you have to put this this thing in front of your face it it's no longer reality now you've got a now you've got a brick in front of your face in a in a you know in a, in a phone usually but it's I, I think it's really cool that we can all be experimenting with it and we can all be making it and all be finding out what to do i mean at the beginning of 2d you know, filmmaking back in the, what, the early 1900s, late 1800s, um, people were just using their imagination and they were working their way through. And we have a, a mm -hmm. whole different thing now to think about with video yeah. and work our way through that. So let's jump on to another question here and uh, and talk post-production. So we'll, we'll jump out of the VR space um, and go back to normal video. <laughs> so All right. When you're in post, <laughs> what's your favorite tool? Ooh. Well, I, the, the, the things that I use for post are Premiere Pro and After Effects. And I pretty much use them interchangeably. I'm dynamically linked actually both ways sometimes. Mm -hmm. And if nobody out if somebody if somebody out there doesn't understand what dynamic linking is with the Adobe products, I can I can put them together, and if I make a change in one, it appears in the other, and I, I can I can really work through a project. And I typically have um, probably sixty percent of what I do is in After Effects, and the other forty obviously is in Premiere Pro. But Premiere Pro has all those After Effects links in it, 
So that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing, or it's been my workflow, I think lately. So um, let me, let, let's just try to help people understand that. So you can have basically one file that you're working on and one or one project that you're working on, and you can seamlessly edit it from one app to the other. So you can be yes. in Premiere and then you can do something in that file in After Effects, but then jump right back and take all of those. Then Premiere sees all of those changes that you made in After Effects as right. you continue to edit it in Premiere. Right, right. And I can cut it in Premiere and, and, and I can take that After Effects composition. Um, it, the big paradigm shift between After Effects and Premiere Pro is that Premiere Pro has a timeline. I can add as much as I want to it. I can stack things up. Doesn't whatever. After Effects have a timeline? It, no. <laughs> it, yes, yes, but no. After Effects works in compositions, and the compositions are of a set duration, where in Premiere, there's no set duration. So if I start a composition in After Effects, okay. and let's say I set it at 12 seconds, then I've got those 12 seconds to work with in Premiere, even though I can cut them, I can cut it down. And if I want to, I can expand that 12 seconds, control K is your buddy, um, in After Effects, but I can't, I, it's the only way that I can expand the time. So you have to think of one as a, I guess the composition is thought of as a, as a closed space and part of what I'm doing in Premiere Pro. And then Premiere Pro is kind of an open space. I can throw whatever I want on the timeline and the timeline grows or contracts or whatever with the, if I take stuff out of contracts. So it's, yeah, that might be an interesting, <laughs> interesting thing to see a little tutorial on to visualize it. Cause I think we used to call that, didn't we used to call that round trip editing in, uh, it is. in, in, it in is. web development or whatnot? Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And there's, there's analogies to make for, for other stuff that folks might be familiar with. Like, um, and one of the greatest advantages of this, like Steve's generally, I, I assume, doing both ends yeah. of this process yourself. But when you start working with a distributed team, it becomes even more handy because you can have a motion graphics yes. person working on motion graphics at the same time that you're working on the edit and deciding that it's 12 seconds or something like that. It's kind of like deciding what the, what the dimensions are for an image that you're going to create, you know, or something like that. Like there's a, there's a, a constraint there. That's a hard constraint, but then you can take that and you can squish it and stretch it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and these are things that you can't do with something like Final Cut Pro or, or something like that, where it's that dynamic linking. It's kind of like if you have um, a web page and you've got like a style sheet or something that's going to be dynamically changing how things look or, or something like that. Like you don't need to just, you know, put all of your your instructions for how yeah. something's going to look in the web page. You can put it in this other asset which dynamically is going to look things up and you need to refresh every so often to get the newest one, but you don't need to like maintain it. The only disadvantage of it is then when you go to export it, all of this has to render and that's a very processor intensive, you exactly. know, go get lunch exactly. or come back the next day. Exactly. Now, but as long know, as I remember it. the days back when those renderings used to take days on the old, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one and they would 3D, invariably crash. Yeah, one 3D image rendering spread across like a dozen different machines, uh, yeah. churning out the the, the right. still image at the end of the day. <laughs> it's better it's than that now. Way. Yes, <laughs> not as not as not as nice as I'd like it. My dream is in computing is to see everything happen instantaneously. You render takes three seconds to render an hour. Yeah. You know, well, we're not there yet. So this right. is good. So Premiere Pro, as opposed to an After Effects, your, your two primary post-production tools. Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I, I like them both because they, they're, they're so closely, they're so closely linked that with, yeah. with the dynamic, the dynamic linking, you can work in both. And to Sam's point, if you're doing distributed editing or, and, or video building or whatever you want to call it, um, Premiere Pro's got a, you know, Premiere Pro and After Effects are pretty good. And I also work with, um, the audio part. Yeah. If you're building a soundtrack, um, that, you know, that's something that we don't talk about a lot, but the soundtrack is as important 
as the the video. I mean, it's, there's and, no where, and what do you use it. for the soundtrack? Um, audition, audition, Adobe Audition. Okay, I forgot what because I can do the same thing. I can right click on the sound, and I can go to audio. Ah. I can go to audition, and the soundtrack will change. You know, I change it. I normalize it. I do whatever, and edit. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't edit if you shorten a clip from that's in Premiere, then the lip sync goes all all haywire. Oh right, but if it's it, but if you um, if you need to correct sound or if you want to build a multi-track clip, um, you can do all that stuff in in, in Audition. Yeah, Audition's yeah. a good product too. Yeah. I've, I've used that. Yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to stuff. Michael for uh, mentioning uh, using Blender, which is a free 3D tool you can get for composite video. And I'd never thought of that before. I'd be curious now to jump back in. I haven't touched Blender in a long time, and yes, it does have a steep learning curve. Um, yeah. But uh, but I, I hadn't thought of using it for compositing video before. So um, I may uh, I may have to jump back in there and uh, take a look because that's. Um, I see the only disadvantage is that dynamic linking to that. Sure. that I mean, they're all good tools. Um, actually, um, After Effects now has um, um, what is 4D, Motion 4D built into it as part of it. So you can make, you can do things 3D and stuff does, like uh, that. So Yeah, does that dynamic linking apply to their, uh, to what is it, um, to Captivate as well? So can you? Yes and had dynamically yeah. linked stuff yeah. from Premiere into you've got You can't add After Effects to Captivate. I don't believe. But you can add a Premiere timeline, I think, to After Effects now. And as soon as you change that timeline, you it changes in, it changes in Captivate. Oh, okay. Cool. It's, no, yeah, I haven't good, done any good, of that. Yeah. Joe's the, Joe Ganji's the expert in that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's jump on to uh, pre-production tips. What are your What are your best mm. pre-production tips for the community today? Let's see. Plan. <laughs> and plan. Is that, is that a software? <laughs> and plan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where do I buy it's that? This software. software. It's, it's the software, software inside your skull. <laughs> Um, and, and be aware that as soon as you touch the record button, you move into this zone of entropy where anything can happen and most anything will happen. So it's, you know, no matter how much you plan, um, something's going to go awry or amuck or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's pretty, right. it's pretty interesting. <laughs> I've started actually writing a, a, a document about the entropy. I'm calling it the entropy of video production. Um, I mean, you know, as soon as you start rolling, I don't care how much you set up. Um, it, it goes crazy. Something's going to happen. Sam had a thing where last week or the week before where he had a backup of a backup of a backup of an equipment and everything and everything. It was a total fail, you know? Well, you hey, can't you do know, anything about yeah, the physical so, equipment. So, so let's, um, Sam. I want to give you a chance because I definitely did want to talk to you about this. Your uh, your workshop at the online learning conference. Give us a. Did, Steve, did you hang out with uh, with Sam during that? Not during the workshop. We were after the workshop. Yeah. I don't think I got down there until until after your workshop was almost over. So how did that go, Sam? Tell us about that. Yeah, I was I was early. Um, well, it was the the one hour version of the the full day thing that I do on smartphone cinema. And I know, um, Steve, you were also talking about smartphone yeah. tips for capture yeah. and stuff like that, too. Um, so this was uh, this was like the condensed version. We didn't really have much time for hands on. I, I introduced people to the, you know, autofocus and, and being able to change their their, um, you know, white balance and stuff like that. But um, but it was it was pretty uh, pretty tight, uh, timeline. So we couldn't do too much hands on, but it went very well. It was very well attended. I was happy to see that there were only like a couple seats left and, you know, things like this sometimes, like if I'm at the back of the room, I come in, you know, and I'll see a couple minutes of this speaker and then I'll go to the next one and a couple minutes of that speaker. And then I'll go to that. Cause you kind of get the idea. Okay. I've got the download of the handouts, you know, I'm all good. Um, I didn't lose anybody in this one, which was, which was, I think a first that, everyone who was there actually nice. stayed. 
um, it was a pretty good crowd um, for uh, for this conference. Um, I think there were about 500 people or so that were there. Hey, there's a smartphone the, now. Uh, um, shooting itself. <laughs> yeah. The video is helping. And, uh, and of course, I was... I was videoing the thing about video. I had my Mevo there set up to, uh, you know, pan and, and track me across the room and stuff. Um, I haven't looked at that video yet. Um, the audio is always the thing that's the, mm. the that doesn't work out um, <laughs> because I have like 10 minutes, you know, to set up and, uh, and I'm plugging in the live looper so I can beatbox my intro and that whole thing. And I, I couldn't get, the audio out of the board to then go into my iPad to, to merge with the video signal. So the audio is probably crap and it yeah. usually is in those circumstances um, as far as a capture thing. But the priority was on the people that were there, of course. Yeah, so and, and I got so did anybody, that, were there so. any interesting questions uh, around iPhone video that, uh, or not iPhone, any sort of mobile video production that, that struck you as new or different or is pretty much same old, same old people concerned with? Um, it, well, Steve can speak to this for his session. For mine, um, it was it was a lot of people wanting to know about the audio. Like that's where it's gone wrong for them. Um, and uh, people were very surprised that I was saying zoom with your feet as opposed to like pinching and zooming on the thing. Um, that was just a new idea. And uh, the thing that got tweeted out the most, which kind of surprised me, was put your phone in airplane mode make it a camera, don't That's have idea, it be yeah. anything else but a camera, then do your thing. And everyone was like, oh, that's such a great idea. I'm like, no, that's that's really kind of basic. No, but, but it, it got great. Like I mean, it's one of those things so that I don't really think about, right? Unless you're doing it all the time. A lot of a lot of times people don't think about that easy stuff. So that's it's, it's, it's practical tips like that that seem really easy when we're doing it all the time. But to everybody else who's just kind of learning, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, those are, those are always fantastic tips. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, the real problem with an iPhone or, any, or a Samsung or whatever brand you're using is this right here. Not the, not the, the, I, the headphone jack. It's an old phone. Um, but that's the microphone. And I believe that yeah. um, audio is almost as difficult as video um, or maybe more because the devices we're using just to record, if we're using a phone, just don't have good video. So you need to plug something in additionally. Yeah. Um, somebody has a road is making a very cool. Did you have that, Sam? Was that was that yours? Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. I was showing it off. I, I was just looking to see if I have yeah, it with me within one arm's than, reach and then this don't. one because I, I Yeah. I, yeah, that's the one I have. That's and they a, make one that plugs into your iPhone. Well this one it's a little condenser. So I use this yeah. one actually I use this one on my iPhone actually more than I use it on my big cameras, but if I could take it off. Oh. The, the real thing about audio isn't so much the, the little microphone as, as I demonstrated in the class um, with just like a, a regular mm -hmm. mic, you know, it's not about how much money you spend on the mic. It's about how close it is to yeah. the thing that you're recording. Um, the difference between good audio and bad audio is placement. It's not generally the quality of the microphone. I mean, there's, there's quality arguments, you know, a USB connection versus an RCA or, you know, standard like headphone jack. There are, is different quality to worry about, but the thing that makes the most difference is where the microphone goes and how close it is to the thing that you're recording. And that's a great yeah. device. Yeah. Zoom. Um, yeah. That's the H4. Yeah. I've had it for years yeah. and it's, I, it's almost inseparable from me. Um, when I'm recording, I just record yeah. a second track. It is so easy to sync. Yeah. And once you have that, you know, I do a little clap. And it's yep. instead of instead of the old clapboard. Yep, get the spike on and, the audio feed, and then you know exactly where yep. to line everything up. Yep. And once you get it lined up, yep. lip it sync is well. locked in. I can get rid of the crap audio and use the better audio. Yep. So I use it almost all the time when I record. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether I'm recording with my, my Blackmagic design cameras or my DSLRs or my phone. You know, that's so this is what it looks like when, real I, handy when I switch over oh, yeah. to put it on the phone 
And the the part that you have to remember is, and uh, I think everybody probably knows about this, but the difference between a uh, a connector that has two of the black rings versus a connector that has three of the black rings. And so we have to use this adapter to get into the iPhone. Right. And then we plug the two into the adapter which is nice. And now I can get really good audio right straight into my iPhone. That's, that's a time saver. The, um, Sam does the, 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 uh, the, the little condenser, the road, the, the little condenser for road. Does that have the right, um, the right number of rings and, and everything to snap into the phone? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's it's T R R S is what they okay. what they call it. Yeah, it's set up it's set up specifically to work for uh, for mobile devices. Now, of course, if you're dealing with iPhone seven or above, it doesn't have that jack. So you need yeah. to get an adapter to go into the the lightning. Ah, uh, yes, the old <laughs> lightning issue uh, that we but, now have on the new phones, but we won't go there. Yeah. That doesn't. Uh, it's all about adapters these days, but I, you know, it, it actually wasn't, uh, it wasn't that long ago that I realized and learned about the TRRS versus the TRS. And so it is absolutely important for everybody to know that if you buy a microphone and you try to like, like the road and you try to plug it right in, uh, to your phone that that could be the problem that it's not um, the the mic wasn't made specifically for mobile devices a lot of the microphones these days are made specifically for uh, actually for mobile journalism is what uh, um, they're the market they're targeting and if you get one of those mics they come already dialed in um, to, to to work with most connectors on most you know, mic inputs uh, with the TRRS on the headphone jack too. So, yeah. And as Craig points out, Bluetooth is also an option, which is totally viable. If you have something that's a Bluetooth headset, you now have basically yeah. a remote mic. Um, you just want to make sure you don't get more than like 15 feet away yeah, from yeah. that or yeah, it will start. Sure. And my other yeah. question about that is what's the frequency response of, a, you know, a Bluetooth um Compared to you know, compared to hardwired, hardwired in, uh, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, it it varies. Um, well, it depends on if it's Bluetooth two or three or four, um, and what the device is and what the device can receive, and and there's there's not a simple answer to that question. Um, generally, if you can plug into a USB or a Lightning connector or something, you have more. Uh, available to work with, like a higher resolution to the sound than if you're going in through yeah. just the headphone jack. But most of the time, the headphone yep. jack is just fine. Um, with Bluetooth, you do want to make sure that you've got the right um, the right frequency range, that it sounds good. But if it sounds good, then, you know, it's probably fine. Um, it might not, as according to the specs, be as much information that's that's feeding through. But if it sounds good, then it sounds good. Uh, you know, with when it comes to microphones, um, the microphone that you'll see used all the time, um, you know, even in professional presentations uh, or like the Super Bowl or, you know, the high stakes kind of things is a, is a Shure 58 mic. It's not that they sound better than mics that cost five times as much. Um, they sound good. And that's fine. So they're they're not like a flat frequency response. They're not the best microphone ever, but they sound fine. And so we use them a lot because they're also practically indestructible. Yep, very very strong mics. We had two great mics yesterday uh, on the show. Two great, uh, well, as in microphones, not like mic and mic, but um, uh, e each of them had really good <laughs> condenser mics on, and their audio sounded fantastic. So if if people are looking to uh, to get a better idea, I think um, so. It was, uh, one of them was using the Blue Yeti, uh, and um, the other one was using a Behringer uh, condenser microphone. Um, that was really nice. And both with pop screens, which uh, helped smooth out the sound a little bit too, which was nice. So um, if anybody's really into that kind of yep. stuff, that's always a good direction to go. All right. So um, let's wrap things up with what was something that was really 
that stood out for you at the event? Is there anything new, like besides VR, AR, I mean, like a big overall trend that you, that it maybe even has been around for a while for those of us who are focused on this kind of stuff, but you maybe you finally saw people showing interest or, you know, was there anything like that at any of the events you guys have been to recently? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good answer too. I, yeah. I mean, are, are people yeah. still using the word yeah. micro learning? Let me be more specific. Is that still a thing? Oh, that's a big buzz. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the big buzz right now. Yeah, that's that's still a big big buzz. Shannon Tipton was there, Absolutely. who's you know been a guest here as well. Um, her session yeah. was packed. Yeah. Uh, as as I was just leaving the conference, she had a, a two and a half hour session um, that that looked like it was you know, all the rage. And, uh, and that happened as well at ATD ice earlier this year where she had so many, she had to do it again and all of that. Um, but honestly, uh, for myself, like the stuff that we're doing here is the stuff that's more, uh, interesting and, um, you know, or, or the stuff like Steve was talking about with, with changing the nature of the conference, you know, the conference reimagined experiences that are beyond just dealing with, you know, the standard stuff that we deal with. Th those, those more experiential things are coming from outside yes. the conference world. And, um, and those are the things that, that I'm more interested in that are more new and, and, and I think uh, well, hold so more yesterday, that's what I mean when I say, you know, it's like for us, there's this world, <laughs> right? And everybody in this community is, is, it has a tendency to be looking for something different, right? We've all, we've been there, done that sort of yeah. thing. And so I think yeah. we draw that population of folks that are looking for something new, looking for something different. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, the reason why I ask this is like, a, is the mainstream starting to shift in their, in their thinking and wondering what's going on? Cause a lot of what's going on with, with the importance around micro learning at, you know, in that event style thing, which I think is important to, you know, everybody has to move along and at their own pace. It just reminds me a lot of how popular learning 2.0, all of the sessions that I did back in the yeah. early 2000s, talking about it when it was yeah. new, right? All the sessions are always packed. And then after a couple of years, they're, you know, it's still packed, people still talking about it. And it's just like, you're kind of like, okay, we've, we're kind of starting to move on, but yet the industry is now just finally catching on and, and showing some interest in it. So um, micro learning, and micro video is is maybe a place where people are beginning to understand that they don't need five, 10, 15 minutes of video to be a course or a lesson, that it can be just right. plopped into the into a captivate as like a punctuation mark sometimes, or something to get attention of the attention of the learner um, that or that can focus their attention on a point. Um, it's a, it's a, you have to think about what you're doing in video in order to do good micro learning video. Like what is this specifically is this doing? What, what do I need to do specifically? And sometimes, um, like this conference yesterday. So we started out, I, I just re, kind of recap what we did and it's, we started out in that space that was Tulane architecture. And from there, we, mm -hmm. um, we moved to a, I think it's called Delgado Community College. And they had a, mm -hmm. um, a, a separate a school away from their conference or away from their campus. And they teach firefighting for oil rigs, which is obviously something uh -huh. really important in, down there, but they also teach and certify um, ships captains, and they have the most amazing—I mean, amazing—simulator rooms that I've ever seen outside of an aircraft simulator. And one guy, mm. they they took us in to some live classes, which don't look like they're doing anything, but they're they were piloting ships and piloting a uh, a container ship, you know, with is is something it takes 15 miles to to stop one so you have to be a long right. way in front of this front of this ship and it's 
it, 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 it has a lot of implications to learning. It's like, um, it's like an, air, an airplane simulator, an aircraft simulator that the airlines use, only it doesn't have an up and down dimension other than the waves going up and down. Um, but it's, it, right. it's, it's got, Not you know, a it's, a, it's two dimensional in, in that sense, but it's really complicated. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the map of the Mississippi down there, and if you think about piloting a container ship on the Mississippi, you know, out of the Gulf of Mexico, amazing. I mean, it's really difficult. It's difficult work yeah. and you don't think about it. You know, <laughs> I've powered, I've, I've steered a power boat, you know, you know, skier behind me and, and stuff. And, you know, that's easy. You know, you stop the motor and the boat stops, but you don't have to think 15 miles ahead right. the way you do that, when you're flying you it the way an aircraft. $30 million dollars worth of goods in containers in the yeah. back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or more. Or more Who yeah, knows? Right? <laughs> and then yeah. what else? Did we, oh, then we went to a surgical, um, a surgical simulation center at LSU. And yeah. The whole conference, the whole point of the conference um, is to take the conference out of the hotel, you know, where they charge $60 for box, box lunch or this came in a bag and, right. you know, and, and take it to a place where people can actually interact with situations rather than just PowerPoint presentations that's that's kind of a cool idea but the the logistics of that have to be a little bit insane right as far as getting people from one location to the next in in the right time and then what do you do on the in between times good for that i mean they are but i mean i'm talking like (laughs) what if you what if the drive is like two hours or something between oh you plan out you 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 plan a you plan activities um whether they're presentations on the bus um you know, or whatever, it you just plan activities as part of that as, as part of the ride. Maybe we should, you know, maybe, maybe you, we should think about that because I've often thought of doing a bus trip. Well, b- back when I was doing uh, Guild stuff and and Devler, and I wanted to do a, a sponsored bus trip from Phoenix to Vegas, uh, and um, and have just activities and things on the bus all the way up there. Uh, for the four or five hour drive, but I was never able to really pull it off. Um, but um, maybe, maybe I can figure it out for something else, but, and maybe that you was just because I, there weren't enough people in Phoenix going there that maybe that's why I right. pull it together. But. Right. Right. Maybe. Or people who wanted to start in Phoenix and take the bus and then get away back to Phoenix yeah, and, or whatever. That's what I mean by the logistics side of it. So I'd have to, yeah. I, I, you know, I have to put a little bit more thought into it, but I still think the idea is cool, especially because some of the buses you can, you can, uh, you can get these days are really, really cool. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. Hey, listen, I, mean, we I totally forgot. I've got a nine o'clock meeting I have to get to, and I keep looking at the clock thinking to myself, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap right. up. But then I, you guys get me on another topic. Wrap up. You're driving me crazy. Uh, but I have to wrap <laughs> it up. So Steve Haskins, thanks for hanging out with us today. Tell everybody where they Very can welcome. find you. Thanks. Oh, where can people find yeah. me? Steve at industrial strength learning.com. Yes outstanding industrial strength learning.com okay so i'm gonna drop that in there all right steve great to see you my friend i'm gonna close your video but you're still in the window to chat with folks freely all righty all right steve talk to you later sam good to see you my friend the the traveling machine when do you get home I am throwing the link for uh, Steve's website in here. Um, but yeah, you know how to find Everybody me. Everybody knows where to find you, Sam. Go to your meeting, and of friend. course, every Friday here on Video <laughs> Friday for TLD Chat. Why don't you sing us out of here if you don't mind? <laughs> Thank you. Video Friday. Today. We got more coming up every Friday. 
And every day of the week, Monday through Friday, TLD chat, we'll be right here, I want you to. Now go to your meeting, Brand. Get to your awesome. meeting, Brand. Hey, everybody, have a great weekend. We will see you on Monday. Adios. Thank you, Sam. See everybody. Have a good weekend.